Whenever I visit Rome, I imagine the invisible city. In my mind, there are two Romes. There is the Rome we all know and love, the Rome of sunlight and gelato and buzzing vespas. And then, below the bustle, there is the invisible city, a city of empty streets and broken buildings, the buried city of ancient Rome. Only a tiny fraction of ancient Rome has ever come to light. Most of the rest remains deep underground, propping up the cellars and complicating the subway stations of the present. But here and there, the invisible city reaches up and emerges into the sun. Some of these apparitions are famous. Every guidebook worth its salt, for example, mentions that the Piazza Navona is built on the Stadium of Domitian. But usually, the invisible city is subtle. This video will explore seven ancient buildings that stand quietly disguised in and around modern Rome. Number seven, the Basilica on the Via Incelci. The Via Incelci is a narrow street, slightly curved, that runs for a few blocks through a residential area north of the Colosseum. At first glance, it's remarkable only for the number of parked cars that have been crammed onto it. But this unassuming byway is one of the very few streets in Rome to have been used continuously for 2,000 years. In the days of Caesar and Augustus, the Via Incelci was part of the Clivus Suburanus, the street connecting the Forum with the crowded neighborhoods of Esquiline Hill. Remarkably, the stone paving blocks of the Roman street are just below the modern pavement. Here, as almost nowhere else in Rome, the ground level has changed little since antiquity. Let's imagine, with the help of Google Street View, that we're walking up the Via Incelci. We pass the little Baroque church of Santa Lucia in Celci. Just beyond it, we notice a few stone piers embedded in the brickwork. We stop for a closer look. And then, if we have sharp eyes, or are being helpfully coached by a narrator on YouTube, we realize that we are looking at the wall of a Roman building, preserved to the height of about 30 feet, or 9 meters. The stone piers belonged to the building's ground floor, which housed a series of shops. The shop doors, beneath the arches you can see in the brick, were walled shut long ago. Higher up, just below the roof, you can see another row of arches outlined in the brick. Originally, these were the windows that lit the Roman building's second story. To judge from the size of those windows, this was either a civil basilica, a public building used as a market and hearing room, or the reception hall of a grand late antique mansion. It became a church sometime in the Middle Ages, and was incorporated into a convent during the Renaissance. It still houses nuns today. Number six the mysterious portico. The invisible city is especially tangible in the bend of the Tiber, the ancient Campus Martius. Here, thanks to continuous inhabitation from antiquity onward, almost every building stands in, on, or over ancient ruins. Many streets follow their ancient courses, rising and falling over the collapsed rubble of buried Roman buildings. On a short street not far from the river, an imposing Roman arch protrudes from an otherwise nondescript building. Much more of the structure to which the arch belonged is embedded in the modern building's walls and cellar. The Roman structure, in fact, extends under the whole modern block and into the adjacent one. Although it was clearly large and impressive, its identity has not been established. Some scholars believe it was used to store some of the grain that was distributed to the people of Rome. Whatever it used to be, it now graces a hair salon. Number five, the Arch of Malborghetto. Out beyond the ancient walls, where Rome's suburbs give way to olive groves and umbrella pines, a tall brick house stands beside the highway. It's obviously old, old enough to have the small windows and heavy walls of a castle. But only when you're close enough to see the Roman brickwork of the lower stories does it become clear just how old it is. Originally, this wasn't a house at all. It was a monumental arch, paneled with marble and crowned by bronze statues. 
It was constructed in the early 4th century, almost certainly by Constantine. The prevailing theory is that it was built on the site of Constantine's camp the night before the fateful battle of the Milvian Bridge. It may, in fact, mark the exact spot where Constantine's tent stood and where he had the vision that led him to convert to Christianity. After antiquity, the arch was walled up and became a church. A small village grew up beside it, ringed by a ragged wall. The wall and village were destroyed during one of the Roman nobility's petty wars, and the arch was converted into a house. In later centuries, it became a station for the papal postal service. These days, it's a small museum where visitors can view artifacts discovered in the vicinity and savor the feeling of standing on the spot where a turning point in world history may have taken place. Number 4. The Mansion on the Clivo di Scauro The Caelian Hill is a short walk and a world away from the tourist circus around the Colosseum. It's always been one of my favorite parts of Rome, quiet and green, with aqueduct arches and medieval bell towers looming unexpectedly over cobbled streets. At the heart of the Caelian stands the Basilica of Santi Giovanni e Paolo. Founded by a Roman senator early in the 5th century, the church is one of the oldest in Rome, and is well worth a visit. But we're interested in what lies beneath it. The south side of the basilica is bounded by the Clivo di Scauro, one of those rare Roman streets that has been used continuously for 2,000 years. The stretch beside the basilica is narrow and cobbled, and spanned by a series of picturesque medieval arches. As you make your way up the Clivo di Scauro, pausing here and there for pictures of the arches, you might notice that the wall on your left, beneath the basilica, has the thin bricks of a Roman building, and is punctuated by windows and doors that have long since been filled in. This is the facade of a Roman house. In the 5th century, when Sante Giovanni e Paolo was constructed, a whole block of houses was filled with earth and incorporated into the foundations. The wall visible from the Clivo de Scauro belonged to a 2nd century apartment building, later converted into a private mansion. The richly decorated rooms, shining with mosaic and frescoes, can still be seen beneath the church. Number 3. Santa Pudenziana Santa Pudenziana has the misfortune to stand almost in the shadow of Santa Maria Maggiore. Although it draws a trickle of pilgrims and tourists, the church has never been one of Rome's great attractions. Most of the relatively few who visit come to admire the mosaics of the apse, which are the oldest and among the most beautiful in any Roman church. By the time those mosaics were installed, the building was already centuries old. Santa Pudenziana is one of the very few churches in Rome built into an ancient pagan structure. Beneath the stone and stucco of its medieval facade is a wall of Roman brick and the hall of a Roman bath. The nave of the church was originally the main hall of a neighborhood bath complex built during the reign of Marcus Aurelius. The brick-faced concrete of the bath walls is exposed above the arches on either side of the church's nave, with the outlines of huge windows still visible in the masonry. The outer wall of the bath can be seen behind the church, where a row of ancient arches is visible along the rear wall of a later portico. Number 2. Santa Croce in Jerusalem The Basilica of Santa Croce is one of Rome's seven pilgrimage churches, revered for its collection of relics. Few of the pilgrims and tourists who visit pay much attention to the battered brick walls to the right of the church's facade. Those walls, however, recall a time when the building that now houses the Basilica of Santa Croce was the reception hall of a magnificent imperial palace. The semicircular wall to the right of the church is what remains of the Amphitheatrum Castrense, literally the camp or palace amphitheater. Though only the lowest part of the circuit wall survives, this was originally an impressive three-story structure with seating for thousands. It was part of the sprawling complex known as the Sasorian Palace, a favorite suburban haunt of the Roman emperors in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Besides the amphitheater, the complex included a huge circus, 
and a series of rooms for receiving and entertaining guests. Sometime in the 4th century, the most impressive of these reception rooms was converted into the Church of Santa Croce. This aerial view shows the amphitheater and one corner of the circus, both outlined in red. The black line marks the 3rd century city wall, which incorporated the amphitheater, but cut through the circus. Almost the whole area above the black line was part of the palace complex. Traditionally, the reception hall of the Sasorian Palace was converted into a church by St. Helena, the mother of Constantine, who lived in the palace for years. Although this may have actually occurred after Helena's death, Santa Croce has served as a church for well over 16 centuries. The building has been remodeled many times, to the point that almost nothing ancient is visible inside. The brick walls of the ancient reception hall, however, are still visible here and there between the additions that crowd the exterior. Number 1. The Theater of Pompey It's almost sunset, and you've been sightseeing without mercy all day. You're meandering around the Campo di Fiori and inspecting cafe menus with all the resignation of a tourist about to pay too much for dinner. As you do, you notice that the buildings along one side of the piazza are oddly curved. But since you sagely watched this video before going to Rome, you know exactly why this corner of the city is so oddly shaped. It's built on the Theater of Pompey. The Theater of Pompey was one of the most magnificent structures ever built in ancient Rome. As you've probably guessed, it was constructed by the famous Pompey, who opposed Caesar in the Civil War. The theater, of course, dates to an earlier phase of Pompey's career, when the great general was pouring the wealth he had gained from his eastern conquests into politically beneficial projects. It was Rome's first permanent theater, a monumental three-tiered structure with seats for almost 20,000 spectators, lavishly adorned with bronze and marble statues. After the end of antiquity, as century after century of Tiber floods piled silt over the streets, most of Rome's remaining inhabitants set up their homes and shops among the grand public buildings of the Campus Martius. The Theater of Pompey was no exception. First the arches under the seats were colonized, and then, as the ground level continued to rise, houses rose on the seats themselves. By the Renaissance, the theater was completely covered. Its outline, however, survived, mirrored in the buildings constructed on top of it. As this aerial image illustrates, the shape of the theater is still legible in the cityscape. Quite a bit of Pompey's theater still exists, hidden beneath the buildings that crowd the Campo di Fiori. The drawing shown here represents what the theater would look like if those buildings were removed, a series of gaunt brick and concrete arches, still standing tall. Although none of this is visible from the street, some of the columns that crown the theater's top have been reused in nearby buildings, and a few of the spaces beneath the seating vaults now serve as restaurants, where diners sip wine and struggle with spaghetti amid the ruins of Rome's greatest hidden building. I plan to continue releasing videos about the great buildings and fascinating customs of the classical world, so please consider subscribing. And of course, feel free to like this video if you found it informative. If you appreciate my videos, you might enjoy my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants, Frequently Asked Questions About the Ancient Greeks and Romans. Pre-order early, pre-order often, and tell all your friends. In the meantime, stay tuned, and as always, thanks for watching.